Hello there, fellow Dragonborn. Cupcake Gigabyte here with another Kato's Countdowns. This one for Skyrim Anniversary Edition. We got a whole bunch of stuff, even some brand new Creation Club, I guess it's Creation Club content, on top of everything else. So this is going to be a countdown of 10 unique things that are amazing and powerful that came with Anniversary Edition. I'm not really as uptight with the criteria this time. This is super subjective and also includes weapons and armor and other stuff. But rest assured, these things are awesome. And if you've been around my channel before, you'll know that I do a lot of guides. So I'll be showing the locations of where to get these items as well. This serves as a warning too, if you're worried about spoilers because we're going over quest locations, there's gonna be a little spoilerage. So here are 10 extremely end game, awfully awesome, unbelievable uniques in Skyrim Anniversary Edition. The transforming sword known as Dawnfang slash Duskfang. This has the base damage of glass swords at 14, can be improved to legendary with an ebony ingot and daedric smithing, but possibly the coolest thing about Dawnfang and Duskfang is its unique layered enchantment. This sword shifts forms between day and night. During the day, it takes the form of Dawnfang, but during the night, it transforms into Duskfang. It shows this in its enchantment breakdown too. During daytime, it will deal seven points of fire damage, but at night, it deals seven points of frost damage. On top of these mild damage boosts, there is also a kill counter on the sword that states after killing 12 creatures, absorb five points of health during the daytime or five points of magicka during the nighttime. And after a little testing, it seems like just about anything that you can kill with a sword counts as a creature, including dwarven automatons. Because the Dawnfang and Duskfang does shift between day and night, the kill counter resets with that shift. So this is an infinite charged elemental damage weapon with the ability to charge up for absorb. Thanks to the changing visual effects based on the time of day and based on charges, not needing soul gems whatsoever to keep charge, it's just extra. It's so awesome. But I will say the quest to get the Dawn Fang and Dusk Fang is also fairly awesome and not one of those go and pick it up type of things. To start off the quest, a soul divided, you need to head to Riften and go towards the Ratway. When you approach the Ratway, you'll see that there is a knife embedded with possibly a note that is clipping through the door that you can read, warning the citizens of Riften not to go into the Ratway due to it being dangerous and something about a ghost. Triggering the quest will take you through the Ratway and to the cistern that leads into this extra dungeon, the Guardian Vault. As soon as you get into the main chamber, you'll see that Dawnfang and Duskfang is levitating in the center of the room. But in order to access it, you'll need to head into each of the chambers and finish off these, well, I guess they're trials. If you defeat the Guardian in the left, middle, and right room, you will then be able to pick up the Dawnfang slash Duskfang and have a little fun racking up that kill counter. This one's a little ring that is a bonus of one of the alternative armor quests. The Ring of Masser. It comes with a minus 30% illusion spell cost, plus 20 stamina, and plus 20% sneak. All that on one little ring, and it benefits pretty much everyone. Short and sweet for this ring, and now for where to find it. The quest the Ring of Masser is tied to is for the Daedric Male alternative armor. To start this quest, you'll need to speak to a innkeeper at pretty much any inn and to start the quest Missing Merchant by asking for rumors, then asking, I'm in need of some work, do you have anything for me? If you ask that, then the innkeeper should hand you a note and start the quest Missing Merchant. Reading the note will then guide you towards Trader's Post, which is east of Windhelm past the farms. Part of the bandit crew includes two named individuals, Erwan and Gunther. While Erwan has more context on why Gunther is here now, on Gunther's body, you'll find the Ring of Masser. Context will tell you that the ring could be used to trade for the Daedric Mail with a local Khajiit caravan, but you could also just pay for the Daedric Mail with some gold. But since this is an extremely rare occasion where you have a triple enchanted ring, I would hang on to the ring and get that scratch to pay for the armor too, so you have both. 
The Boots of Blinding Speed. These are kind of a little bit of a joke, but exceptionally helpful with getting around if you can counteract their negative effects. Appearing in the form of Netch Leather Boots with a base armor rating of 11, these come with the Blinding Speed enchantment. This doubles your movement speed, but makes you completely blind. So if going fast is something that you love, you're going to want a night eye effect of some kind, because you come with this naturally. Vampires also have Vampire's Sight, which can be used. And one of these two night eye effects can be combined with the Vision of the Tenth Eye spell given to you while you take on the Illusion Ritual spell quest. But with Vision of the Tenth Eye and a night eye effect active, you'll actually be able to see where you're going fairly well with the Boots of Blinding Speed. As I mentioned, the Boots of Blinding Speed are part of the More Than You Can Chew, or Netch Leather Armor questline. This is a quest that begins in Solstheim, and just to the north of Skull Village, in a little campsite, there will be a corpse of a dark elf that you can get the Peddler's Journal off of. This then leads you to a Reekling tribe that is in a little island in the northeastern area of Solstheim, and you get the option of helping out or destroying their hunting party that is hunting a bull netch. After dealing with the hunt and returning to the Reekling camp, you'll be able to get a book from a nearby chest called Crafting with Netch Leather, giving you the ability to craft Netch Leather yourself and giving you access to a chest back in Skyrim within Fort Ragstad, containing sets of Netch Leather armor as well as the Boots of Blinding Speed. Welcome to why this is not an equipment countdown. Behold, the Dwarven Horse. And I consider this to be the Equestrian Dream after comparing the Dwarven Horse to the rest of the horses available now in Anniversary Edition. Even the Daedric one, I know, it looks awesome, but it doesn't have the same benefits as this one. And it comes down to two things. This horse is invincible. Not just in the traditional, I'm gonna stab you and level off of you sense, but in the sense that it takes no fall damage and neither does its rider. You can jump off of High Hrothgar with this horse and survive. Second, infinite sprint. I was not able to run this horse out of stamina. All of the things that made horses inconvenient are now a thing of the past with the dwarven horse. But there is also a process to get this golden hoofed god, so let's go over that part. I'm not sure how initially this was set up, but this is now kind of combined with Forgotten Seasons, which is a massive dwarven dungeon with its own... Uh, creation club stuff that you can do in it but i'm going to be focusing down on how to get the horse specifically and thankfully it's only in one of the chambers and this will begin right outside where forgotten seasons dungeon is which is the runoff caverns that are southeast of markarth and west of the hendraheim player home right outside of this cave you'll find the body of the dwarven horse with no limbs or head and activating it will start the quest the dwarven horse and then it gives you a vague look around for the parts kind of thing i thought this was actually outside no it's inside the forgotten seasons dungeon so head inside the runoff caverns once you get to the main chamber where the four season entrances are known as the vardenkin gallery you'll be near where you need to start looking for each of the parts for the dwarven horse to the right of the main door you're trying to open is the entrance to autumn's bells this is where you'll find all five pieces you need for the Dwarven Horse. After entering Autumn's Bells, straight ahead will be the corpse of a mercenary, and just to their right will be one of the legs. Continue onward until the room opens up and shows you the depository on the right side. Behind the gate, near the repository, will be the head of the horse, but you'll need to harvest each of the types of grain in the larger room and bring them back to the depository to open up this door. So while you're gathering said grain, you can pick up the rest of the horse's legs while you're at it. Using the local map as reference, the tower that's a bit toppled over on the western side hides one of the legs just off to the left. Another leg is found on the center pedestal at the southern side of the room. And the final leg is found on a broken tower on the eastern side of this massive chamber. So by this point, you should have all four legs and have gathered all the grain that you needed to go back to the depository, deposit the grain, open up the door, and in the back left corner will be the head on another pedestal. Once you've got all four pieces, you can go straight back, deposit all five parts on the dwarven horse's body, and it'll disappear and then reappear fully constructed and able to be ridden. The Dragonbone Mail is a unique piece of the Alternative Armor's Dragon Plate set, or insulated Dragon Plate that got added with Anniversary Edition. Its armor rating is a point or two higher than standard Dragon Plate armor, 100% fire resistance, 
is not very common <laughs> to find as an enchantment on equipment, and this dragon bone mail comes with it. So any problems related to fire or fire-based attacks towards you, the Dragonborn, will be a thing of the past if you're wearing the Dragonbone Mail. Like the other alternative armors, it does come along with its own quest for a full set that you don't have to craft yourself. And this full set includes the Dragonbone Mail. Now on where to find this, as well as the rest of the enchanted insulated dragon plate. So all you need to do is find an innkeeper of your choice and keep picking bounty and rumor dialogue until you get a new dialogue choice that says any bounty work I can help with. The innkeeper should then hand you the bounty for crow's tooth and start the quest bones for a crow. Read the bounty and you'll be sent to crow's tooth's camp, which is in the mountains on the south side of the rift. The quest will also lead you through Darklight Tower, which has its own quest, but this is primarily the way to just get up to that elevation. However you choose to get there, just west of Darklight Tower will be Crow's Tooth's camp. This camp includes a diverse cast of enemies, including a hag raven named Linnell. Defeating her and looting her corpse, you'll get another note. This one sending you to Arkwind Point, another location in the mountains further west. Now Arkwind Point is a place with challenging Draugr most times, and the wide, winding path that goes through the ruins will cause you to run into at least a couple of high-level Draugr. But not the only challenges here, because as soon as you start moving towards the tower ruins, Crow's Tooth and the remains of her crew will attack you. Killing and looting Crow's Tooth as well as Alvasor the Rat should result in some nice enchanted gear to take from their pockets. Once you climb up to the top of the ruined tower, you'll find the corpse of Bjormund Windstrider, off of whom you can get his diary, as well as the full set of enchanted insulated dragon plate armor. And included in this will be the Dragonbone Mail. The infamous Staff of Worms used by the even more infamous Mana Marco. Now yours if you have aspirations of becoming the Lord of the Undead, because what the Staff of Worms does is just lets you cast Dead Thrall on things without the ridiculous conjuration requirement on top. This is a great utility even if you're not invested in conjuration, if you want a just a walking bag of holding, or a particularly powerful enemy that you've slain that you want to raise from the dead to work for you instead. And this is one of many unique items you can get when you take the player home Gallows Hall for yourself. The Dreams of the Dead quest begins upon reading Nara's journal within the abandoned fort on the northern edge of Mara's Eye Pond. This is a short distance east of Gallows Rock. The first puzzle will involve snuffing out torches in a particular order, and once you do, the Staff of Worms will fall, enabling you to pick it up and use it for yourself, as well as use it for the next challenge in the quest, because there are a couple more uniques you can gain through Gallows Hall, along with the Gallows Hall player home itself. But that is how you get the incredibly powerful Staff of Worms. The Fist of Randagolf, of course, is one of my favorites as someone who likes playing punchy type characters. And these are steel plate tier heavy gauntlets that provide 15 base armor rating and come with an enchantment that increases melee and unarmed attacks by 20% and increase damage blocked by 20% with your shield. Sadly, these fists cannot be upgraded at a workbench, but Fist of Steel only gets bonuses from the base defenses anyway, so not a problem when it comes to that. I did see some reports that the 20% for melee and unarmed attacks is actually just a flat 20 bonus, so if we're considering it a flat damage bonus from the enchantment, as well as a bonus from Fists of Steel, you'll be getting 35 bonus unarmed attack damage if you're running a unarmed damage type character. Khajiit, of course, getting the best bonus out of all of the races. Obviously, all I had eyes for was the unarmed bonus, but because it has melee in its wording too, that includes both one-handed and two-handed usage as well. So anybody who uses one-handers, two-handers, or fists as their weapons will benefit from the fists of Randagolf. So let's go over where to get them. You get this through the contest. This is something that was brand new in Anniversary Edition. The quest related to the contest is Caught in a Web, and you can activate this quest by reading Adonato Leotelli's journal in Candlehearth Hall in Windhelm. You just go upstairs in Candlehearth Hall and find the table in the corner, and his journal should be right there on the table. The quest takes you to Kronvanger Cave, where you need to fight a particularly disgusting spider, and after defeating said spider, it'll point you to two unique rewards for you. The Ice Blade of the Monarch, and what we're all here for, the Fists of Randigulf. 
Conjure Alien Lich, a wonderful expert level conjuration spell which summons an Alien Lich for 60 seconds after it's cast. It appears as though when summoned, the Alien Lich has a pool of powerful spells that it draws from each time it's summoned, as well as being able to summon and raise its own minions. So the Alien Lich can cause you to have a minion of your minion. The Alien Lich appears as though they can hold their own against just about anything and can be a great help when dealing with certain enemies like say you don't have much for ranged and you're fighting a dragon that won't land, then the Alien Lich can help you out with that. Of course, this is added to the countdown because it is technically unique because there's only one spell book that you get for summoning the Alien Lich. There's a pretty sizable disappointment that comes along with getting this spell, and it's that you have to be level 46 to start the related quest to get it, but it is still one of the many unique things you get through the cause. So to start the cause, you do need to be level 46. You'll be approached by a courier and they'll hand you a note labeled Stranger's Plea. Reading the note will begin the quest. As you're investigating the resurgence of the mythic dawn, you'll learn of an alien ruin called Riel, and this is where you'll need to go to find the Great Welkin Stone, primarily to keep it out of the mythic dawn's hands. Once you have the Great Welkin Stone, you can head to the Atronach Forge, which is underneath the College of Winterhold. In the Midden, combine a ruined book, salt pile, and the Great Welkin Stone in the receptacle, pull the switch, and you should create a tome of Conjure Alien Lich. Then you need only read it to commit this powerful spell to memory. Now for the gorgeous scimitar known as True Flame. This one-handed sword comes with a base damage of 16, matching that of Daedric swords, and comes with a fire enchantment that burns its target for 30 points. You may wonder what makes this better than a Daedric sword with a fire enchantment. This one has infinite charges. Also, for the sake of improving, it looks like this is under Dwarven Smithing rather than Daedric or Ebony, so improving True Flame at the Grindstone is much easier than improving other endgame swords. Of course, you'll still need Arcane Blacksmith too. Now on where to get True Flame, along with many other uniques along the way, this is gained through the Ghosts of the Tribunal quest, which can begin in Soul's time within the Temple of Ravenrock. Inside the temple and downstairs in the first room on the right, on the table you'll find Heretic Dossier Blacksmith's Confessional, which will start you on your way. The first location you'll be heading to will be Falbathar's, a Dwemer ruin overtaken by Reeklings. After getting past the room with 10 buttons, most of which are booby-trapped, the door to the left in the following hallway will be brand new, simply called the Falbathar's Forge. In here you'll find an aggressive Kenro Hlan, and on his corpse you will find an unenchanted weapon, a Falbathar's Forge Gem, an ebony scimitar to play around with, and a note. The note will read that you need three more of these Falbathar's Gems to forge the True Flame and these are found throughout the rest of the Ghosts of the Tribunal content. One, obviously, from Kenro. The second, off of the unnamed buyer that you find after following a Redoran guard to the old Adius Farm cellar. The third, inside of the Armory of Ashfall's Tear, among many other valuable artifacts. And the fourth and final will be on the Priest of Dagoth Ur that you must defeat towards the end of the quest line. After you've gotten all four Forge Gems, you can go back to Falbathar's, apply the Pyroyal Tar to the unenchanted weapon, ensure all the gems are in place, and then put the unenchanted sword into the forge for a quick second, then you'll be able to retrieve it as the True Flame. As if stealth archery needed to be encouraged any further, here is the Bow of Shadows. It comes with a base damage of 19, which sits firmly in between Daedric and Dragon, and comes with two outrageously powerful effects, stating weapon draw is 20% faster and casts invisibility for 30 seconds. So stealth archery, but more of it. Even mid-combat, you can put away and pull back out your bow and you can disappear, as if having the perks of maximum stealth. But it's just the bow doing it. And if you have the Arcane Blacksmith perk, it can be improved with Ebony Ingots at the Grindstone. Now for where to find this artifact of Nocturnal. It starts in a little place called Whiterun, don't know if you've heard of it, by speaking to Proventus, the advisor to Jarl Balgruf, or Brill if Balgruf has been exiled. Asking, is there anything you need of me will result in them handing you a note. Starting the quest, in the shadows. This will involve foiling an attempted assassination on Jarl Balgruf, and once you find out where the assassin will be and when, provided Jarl Balgruf is unoccupied by main quest stuff, the assassin will be cloaked waiting in the upper floor to strike, where you can then take them out and take the Bow of Shadows for yourself. Saving the Jarl's life and getting a sweet artifact 
all in a day's work for the Dragonborn. Now I would love to hear your favorite uniques that you've found throughout playing Skyrim Anniversary Edition, because there are, well, more than 10, that's for sure. But these are a handful of the ones I found to be useful or powerful or having the cool factor, whatever subjective descriptor you want to throw out there for this countdown. If you did find this useful, entertaining, or both, please do whatever it is you see fit to show that. And among the things you can do is by supporting on Patreon. There's monthly update vlogs that include my face, special Discord roles for supporters, and access to unlisted stuff that didn't quite make it to the channel. Speaking of supporters, thank you to my patrons that are on screen now, including my Wasteland Legends, Ben and David Hoover. Thank you so very much for watching. I'm Cato Genesis, and may you wander Tamriel like you own it.